Hello, and welcome to the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. I'm your host, Benjamin Douglas, and this is the show where each week I read a chapter from a different indie author. Thanks for joining me for today's reading. Hi, and welcome to episode number three, the third episode of the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. Today, I'll be reading from indie author Timothy Ellis, who was gracious enough to give me permission to do so. Thanks for joining me, and I hope you enjoy the reading. I first encountered Timothy Ellis on Kboards, where I saw a post he had written that had grown into a rather large thread. And if you're an indie author on Kboards, or if you're a lurker on Kboards, I suggest you check out his post if you haven't already seen it. Um, There's a lot of information there, some of which may not be pertinent to you at all, but some of which might be. And there's a lot of encouragement to be taken as well. There's an amended title to his post. I think it's something like, Book three was the trick. (laughs) Woohoo! And basically, the story is, after writing some nonfiction spirituality books, Timothy began a fiction series. It's sort of a science fiction amalgamation with some other genre tropes put in. And uh, it's in the distant future. Uh, Humanity has achieved interstellar space travel, and we've begun colonizing our spiral arm spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy. And he follows one man's sort of story in this series, um, Hunter, John Hunter. So uh, he the, the story is he got to book three, and apparently the series just really took off in terms of sales. And ever since then, he's just put out book after book after book, And he's done lots of interesting um, strategies like punctuating uh, his novel releases with shorter sort of novella, short story length titles in between, apparently with some success. Um, So there are some interesting um, tactics and strategies that you could learn about from that thread if you haven't seen it already. Now, I'd like to read Timothy's Amazon author bio. Timothy Ellis lives on the Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia, where he constantly battles with his cat for possession of his desk chair, Daleks do guard duty, and he keeps his sonic screwdriver next to his lightsaber and wand. He eagerly awaits a female Doctor Who, and the sound of the TARDIS materializing in his house. He has spent his life reading and watching science fiction and fantasy, and has been playing space genre computer games since he used to be smuggled in to play the original text Star Trek game on a university mainframe, long before the PC or Apple appeared. Since 2004, he's written game guides for the Egosoft X Universe series, culminating in two versions of the X3 handbook. He also designs major mods for the various games, and dozens of mini-mods. He has been a farm worker, antique dealer, computer programmer, systems analysis, operations manager of a small retail chain, and a retail store owner. He is now a full-time author, who also works as a spiritual healer and helper. After leaving behind the corporate and business worlds, he was opened to his spiritual gifts. Now a feng shui master, feng shui led him to Buddhism, karma, the Tao, and back to Western spiritualism. Since 2006, he has been writing spiritual articles and helping people via spiritual forums and Facebook groups. His spiritual books include Personal Healing Using Basic Meditation, Life Harmony, Feng Shui in Plain English, 
101 Tips for the John of God Brazil Experience. And The Wisdom of the Ages is Available for the Price of Asking a Question, series of eight books. His first novel, Hero at Large, spawning the long-running The Hunter Legacy series, brings together his love of the space genre, spirituality, and cats. If you wish to be kept up to date with new releases and information in the Hunter Legacy series, subscribe here, and then there's a mailing list link, and follow on Amazon, Goodreads, or BookBub. All right, so quite a bit of information there. Um, and then I'm going to read Timothy Ellis's Amazon author rank. This is as of March 30th, 2017. Amazon, Amazon author rank beta. Number 59 in Kindle eBooks, Science Fiction and Fantasy, Science Fiction. Number 75 in Books, Teens. And number 99 in Books, Science Fiction and Fantasy, Science Fiction. Usually, I like to read uh, the first chapter from the first in-series novel by an indie author, or, or something that's perma-free, perhaps, um, something that's readily accessible to everyone. But when I reached out to Timothy, and he was very quick and very gracious uh, with his response, he suggested that I could read a first chapter if I liked, which I have done, um, but that he'd, he would also be interested to hear the Cat World chapter from his second book. And as I did the reading, I began to understand why, which is that these books, yes, they're science fiction, and you can see that he's ranked pretty well in science fiction. Um, and there are elements maybe of some space opera and some action and adventure, spirituality, certainly, for his main uh, character. But there's also sort of a playful tone and a little bit of whimsy um, in the writing, which is exemplified, I think, by his inclusion of cats in the subject matter, in the description of the series, which is clearly, right, by the branding, um, hero this, hero that, with spaceships on the covers. It's clearly like a sci-fi action adventure, go shoot them up. And yet, here he is saying it's about cats. So what's that all about? Well, um, what I actually did for today, I read only from his second book in the series, Hunted Hero Hunting. Um, and I read the first chapter, and then I read uh, most of the Cat World chapter, because they're fairly short. Um, and you'll see there's sort of this wry sense of mm, sometimes dark humor. You'll hear, rather, pardon me, in that first chapter. And then, of course, the Cat World chapter, I think Timothy really enjoys because apparently he's just a cat person, like to the nth degree. Uh, so if you're a cat person, I imagine that chapter will also tickle you, seeing how cats are treated and how cats treat their humans um, <laughs> in the distant future. One last thing I'd like to clarify, and that is that this reading does not come from the official audiobook. This is just my reading created just for this podcast. If you'd like to hear the rest of the book in audio form, please do go to the author's webpage or the author's Amazon author page to see if the audiobook is available. Without any further ado, let's get on to today's two Timothy Ellis readings. Hunted Hero Hunting Book Two of the Hunter Legacy by Timothy Ellis Chapter One Freeze, mother bitch! We both went rigid, except for the part of me that already was, which suddenly wasn't. My head turned towards the voice. The moment of surprise lingered as I gaped at the security droid pointing two stunners at us. Awareness of movement brought my attention back to the girl straddled over me. 
Her arm started to descend, something in her hand. A gun went off, and she was blasted off me to land on the floor near the wall. I gaped first at the naked girl on the floor, and then at the security droid that had shot her. Jane? I asked. Jane was my ship's artificial intelligence, or AI. She was a top-level, state-of-the-art computer program with her own distinct personality who was controlling the security droid by remote link. Normally, it displayed the look of an early 20s girl using the shape-changing belt I used for a uniform and spacesuit. But she, it, had been using clever suit programming to put the droid into a form of chameleon mode against the wall where it had been completely invisible to us. The girl hadn't known it was there, and I had forgotten. Don't touch the hairpin. It's poisoned. She was about to stab you with it. Where did you get Freeze Mother Bitch from? You don't want to know. I probably didn't, either. Jane had a habit of following up on what I collected, watched, and read, and inserting it back into our conversations. The price you pay for getting the top-of-the-line AI, I guess. Eccentric was a good way of describing her personality. Maybe it was just me. I didn't recall a specific reference in this case. Venus Trap? I asked. Venus Trap, she confirmed. I jumped up off the bed and went over to the still form of the naked girl. Fallen from her right hand was an antique hairpin. It had the shape of a cat on top, with a long, thin, sharp end. The point did appear to be wet. I checked her hair. There was a tiny scabbard fixed to her hair, which must have kept her protected from the poison. I dressed and pinged station security for a team to attend. They showed up quickly, and I met them at the door to my hotel suite. The leader identified himself as Sergeant Allen, and I led him and the three members of his team into the bedroom. Allen went over to the still girl and took a good look at her face. Well, bugger me, he said. Do you know who you have here? I shook my head. This is Lisa Santiago, one of the best assassins in the business. As shocks go, that was a good one. I was already two for two with the Santiago family. Except in their cases, they were both dead. Santiago? I asked. Yes. Louis Santiago's daughter. Wanted in every sector. You want to tell me what happened? Friends of mine left today. He nodded. I was feeling a little lost without them. Spent some time on the mercenary guild ranges. Ate a lonely dinner and decided I needed some company. So you decided to pick up an assassin? He interjected with a grin. No, I wasn't intending to pick up anyone. After dinner, I went to the nightclub, danced a bit by myself on the side of the dance floor, did some line dancing. Somewhere during the evening, I found myself dancing with this cute blonde. I indicated the form on the floor. We started talking as well as anyone can talk in a disco environment, and ended up here. 
She was on top of me on the bed when my security droid told her to freeze. And when she didn't, shot her with a stunner. I dressed and pinged security immediately. My droid says that the hairpin on the floor is poisoned, so be careful of it. The security officer about to pick it up jerked his hand away. Does your security droid have a feed of the event? Alan asked. Jane? Yes, John. Alan looked, questioning at me, hearing the female voice come from a droid. Ship's AI controlling the droid, I said. He nodded. Do you want the feed? I guess it will be somewhat R-rated. Yes, please. We need a definite offense to charge her with, and assault with intent to kill will do just fine to start with. We do need to prove that. Don't worry, it will be handled discreetly, and only the key people in the case, and the judge, will get to see what happened. They will only see the actual attempted assault. We will take her into custody and send the hairpin for analysis. Even if it doesn't come back as poisoned, it's still attack with a deadly weapon, as the point would have killed if she hit you in the right place. And take it from me, she was an expert. Some of her victims had only a tiny hole in them, and in several cases, the hole was in the eye. I winced. I told Jane to pulse the feed to Sergeant Allen. Another security officer entered with a sled. Lisa was gently placed on the sled, still naked, and secured to it. Her clothes were collected and placed in an evidence bag. Sergeant Allen put on thick gloves and retrieved the hairpin, putting it in another evidence bag. The sled and the other officers left. We will advise the General's office and the guilds of Santiago's capture as soon as she is in a safe place. I guess you can expect some appreciation for that. He grinned. I escorted him out. I sat in an easy chair in the sitting room and thought about what had happened. Lesson learned, I thought. That will teach me to bring home the first girl to dance with me. And the first time I go out on my own. I had every reason to be totally paranoid, and yet I wasn't. Ignoring reality was not conducive to a long life. I sighed. I sent off a search, looking for sector or guild overlays that might be able to let me know if someone nearby was on their wanted lists. I already had sensors that would tell me if a weapon was close, but this obviously was not enough. And it had failed to identify the hairpin as a weapon. Damn, I'd actually complimented her on the hairstyle and the cat on the hairpin. She must have been laughing at me inside the whole time. The search came back with sensor overlays from Australian Sector Military and the Bounty Hunters Guild. The former I could access, because I held the rank of flight officer in the sector militia. The latter, because I was a member of the guild. The former was free. I had to buy the second. No big deal for the security it offered. I sat there, pondering the last few weeks. Fifteen days ago, I had been an apprentice on my first trip into space. At home, because my planet had a longer rotation period around its sun than Earth did, I was counted as 16 years old, barely an adult, not yet old enough to own property. In Earth standard terms, used by all space stations, I was 18 and considered a full adult. 
On the jump into Sydney, we were attacked by a nasty pirate, apparently the father of the girl who had just tried to kill me. By destroying the cockpit of our ship, my uncle was killed and I was badly injured. However, I'd managed to return the compliment with the pirate, and in doing so, had saved myself, a freighter, and a military transport. I'd spent a week unconscious in hospital. I'd come out bruised down my left side and limping. As if the cosmos had a sense of humor, I always seemed to get hurt again on my left side. The military transport, oddly named Moose, had been home for a mercenary company, led by Colonel Smith. She had assigned twin sisters, Amanda and Alicia Peck, to be my bodyguards. They and Allison, the team's medic and administrator, had taught me a lot, and kept me out of the trouble I seemed destined to fall into. All three had become more than friends. I'd progressively met the rest of the team. George Murdoch, their second pilot, turned out to have a sense of humor matching my own. He tinkered with suit programming, and I kept giving him ideas. B.A. was the combat strike leader. Thinking about them always left me associating their names with a very old flat-screen series about another group of mercenaries. Abigail, who taught me to pilot a dropship by amusing herself at my expense, was the team's tech and comms expert, who I suspected was a really good hacker. Aline and Agatha were the team gunners, and Elena the demolitions expert. All they lacked was a combat pilot, and they kept trying to recruit me. The whole team had become a sort of surrogate family for me, since mine were time-locked behind the Outback System's policy of isolation. I couldn't go home for a year. The pirates had returned, threatening the station with a nuke if I didn't give myself up. No one knew my history with space combat games and simulators, and I turned the tables on the pirates in my first actual combat. No good deed goes unpunished, and I'd found myself drafted into the sector militia. The general, Sergeant Allen had mentioned, was General Harriman, my boss. I met a new friend in Bob Dare, the owner of Sydney Shipyard. He built me a custom-designed fighter ship. But before it was ready, Colonel Smith had shanghaied me into a rescue mission. I piloted a dropship for the first time, and narrowly avoided splatting us across what would have been squashed top floors of a building on the planet Melbourne. That ended well, as did my capturing a fighter on our way home by jumping out of the dropship onto it and blasting in the hatch. B.A. was not amused at me usurping her job, and in hindsight, I wondered at the recklessness I had shown. I'd taken Excalibur, my new fighter, for a test run, and run straight into a pirate ambush. The new ship had performed well, but I'd needed a tow home. Now I was waiting for the repairs and upgrades to be completed. My Merc friends, with Moose's upgrade complete, which I had designed and paid for, had left for a mission somewhere in the American sector, leaving me all alone for the first time. I didn't seem to have any control over events at the moment. 
Picking up an assassin and letting her almost kill me just seemed to be par for the course and part of my current luck. I sighed. Too much had happened in a short time, and I felt as if I was lurching uncontrollably from one disaster to the next. One good thing, I didn't have to worry about credits. People always seemed to appreciate the actions I took and were dumping credits on me. Law and order was as much through the actions of privateers, bounty hunters, and mercenaries as it was by civilian authorities. I was now listed with the various guilds, as all of these. The system worked, as long as you stayed alive. I was working on that, but apparently not hard enough. I needed to do better. I stripped off and had a long shower. The bruises I had gained from my encounter with the first Santiago were finally beginning to fade, but I still ached. The emotional battering of the evening didn't help, either. I went to bed. Chapter 27 There was a disturbance near the main shopping concourse just after we arrived. A squad of security officers ran past us and disappeared up the corridor we had just come from. Susie watched them go, then caught sight of our destination and started dragging her mother along. I lagged behind a bit. Jane, sit rep, I subvocalized. You were being followed. When he took his gun out, I shot him. Security is arriving now. Okay, let them deal with it. You close up a bit while we are in the store. Confirmed. I picked up the pace and caught back up. We entered Cat World. The store was larger than the previous pet shop I'd been in, but was exclusively about kittens and cats. The shop assistant looked up as we entered and smiled. He came around the counter to meet us. He walked right up to me and took the carry cage out of my hands. He held it up so he could peer in. Greetings, madam, he said into the cage. I gawked at him. He ignored me. What can we do for you today? He paused and Angel meowed. Ah, uh, I see. Acquisition has just occurred, and you wish the comforts to be provided? Another meow. Certainly, madam. Have your slave follow me. He handed me back the cage. Slave? He turned and walked off. We followed. Mary and Susie were grinning. At one end of the store were three rooms with glass fronts. Inside was a chaos of kitty castles, scratch poles, ramps, sleeping baskets, toys, and who knows what else. He opened one of the doors and turned to Susie. My dear, you may take her into that room and play for a while. Would you like that? Yes, please! Susie took the cage from me and walked inside. I moved to follow her, but the shop assistant stopped me with a hand on my arm. Only cats and children are allowed in the playrooms, sir. Please follow me. He shut the door behind Susie, and she let Angel out. They started to play. Mary and I followed him into the food section. He looked at Mary. You are the breeder? She nodded. Yes, I thought so. What dry food does Madame prefer? She told him a brand name. 
we moved towards the other end of the aisle. He turned to me. What sized ship do you have? Heavy transport. He looked vague. It's a new class, bigger than a medium freighter. Ah, good. Then you will be buying in bulk? I nodded. Splendid! He rubbed his hands together. He pointed to a large bag. This is the brand she is eating now. It is kitten formula, so once she reaches maturity, you will need to change to the adult formula. For one puss, a half pallet should suffice. He looked to Mary again. Main meals? She told him another brand. We moved again. Serving size, he asked. Quarter pouch, morning and night. He nodded and turned to me. Butler droid? I nodded. He looked back to Mary. Taste preference? Tuna. She prefers the one with jelly. Quiet. That would seem to indicate this one. This, this, that, and... Oh, maybe this one for a change. He pulled out pouches. Mary looked at them. Yes, she has eaten all of those, but given a preference, she prefers the first one. Fine. He looked at me. We can do you a mixed palate, two-thirds favorite, one-third mixed variety of the others. He raised an eyebrow at me. I nodded. Splendid! We moved to a different aisle. It was filled with different types of litter. He turned to Mary again, and she told him a brand. We moved up the aisle. Good brand, this one. Pallet? I nodded. Splendid! We moved again. This aisle had food and water dispensers. Done these, I said. He sniffed and moved on. We followed. The next aisle had doors and fences. He looked at me. Stairwell? Yes. Five decks and the hangar bay. She will mainly be on the top deck. You will need one of these, then. He pointed to a short fence with a door on the end. This will stop Madame from entering the stairwell, at least until she is old enough to negotiate it safely. Are the ship spaces doored off? I nodded. Good. Instruct your butler droid which doors she is allowed to go through. Can I see a specification of the top of the stairwell? I threw up a holographic screen and displayed the ship spec for the top deck, zooming in on the stairwell. He examined it for a while. You will need to attach the cat wall here, he pointed, and here, he pointed again. Your butler droid will be able to do the task. The kit is custom made for the space. The butler will get instructions from the box and should have no trouble installing it. The door is easy enough to use, but most adults simply step over it. As you can see, it is designed so the kitten cannot jump over it. He started walking back to the cat room. Let's see how Madame has progressed with her choices. We found Susie and Angel playing on and around a kitty castle. We stopped outside to watch. Angel looked up, saw me, and began a crazy, chaotic dance around the room. Pay attention, sir. You are being told what to purchase. I looked at him in surprise. 
Yes, I thought so. Untrained. He ignored me and watched Angel. Eventually, she moved back to the kitty castle and lay down. Okay, the kitty castle she's on, the standard scratch pole, the adjustable ramp, the deluxe cat bed with hot pad, and I think toy pack number three. I must have looked surprised. Let me explain. Kitty Castle is essential if you wish to preserve your bed in good condition. The scratch pole would seem redundant given the scratch potential of the castle, but believe me, cats like to stretch out while they scratch, and sometimes only the regulation pole will do. Ramps are good for kittens because they are easy to run up and down rather than them clawing their way up onto things, doing damage, or being tempted to jump down too far and hurting themselves. Adjustable ramps mean you can use them anywhere. The actual angle doesn't matter. You will need one for your bed, and I would suggest the six-pack, just to be sure. The cat bed with warmer features is because ships tend to be a little cold for cats, especially kittens. Sometimes they need to be warmer while they sleep. The deluxe model senses the temperature of the room, the temperature of the cat, and automatically adjusts to provide a warm bed. Toys are essential for keeping your cat good-natured and thus keeping you sane. Butler droids are programmed to play with cats when they have nothing else to do. She chose toys mainly found in Pack 3, and the others could still appeal when she tries them out. He suddenly scanned the room. Damn! I'll be right back! He rushed off. I looked at Mary with a bemused expression. She grinned back. A few minutes later, he returned with a ball, looking like it had a tail on it. He pressed a button, opened the door, and placed the ball on the floor. It immediately started rolling all over the place, the tail part carried along with it. Angel looked up and went into a long sitting position, intently watching the tail wagging around. Her bottom lifted, waggled, and she pounced on the tail. Pinned under, the tail could not move, but the ball was trying to escape. She batted the ball with the paw pinning the tail, and the whole thing shot off in another direction. She jumped, turned, raced to the kitty castle, went up a level, and started observing again. Again, a butt waggle, and she pounced on it again, rolling over, biting and scratching at it. Then, as it moved against her, she rolled over, jumped away, and again took position on the castle. Yes, I thought so. What is that? asked Mary before I could. Cat ball, he replied. Actually, it's had many names down the centuries, but here at Cat World, our version is called the Cat Ball. Very popular with cats, but you can never tell how they will react. Some are terrified of it and won't go near it. Others stake it out about two meters away and simply watch it. Others, like Madame here, actively play with it. Should last a year or two, unless she shreds the tail part first, which is most unlikely for a cat. He beckoned to Susie to come out. She jumped up and headed for the door. Angel, seeing her leaving, walked into the carry cage, 
still watching the cat ball like a hawk. He went in and closed the door of the cage, lifted the cage out, handed it to me, and shut the door behind him. Without another word, he headed for the counter. He was busy on the desk comp when we caught up with him. He nodded to me, and an invoice pulsed in. I checked it and found everything but the cat ball on it. I opened my mouth to ask, but he turned and went into the room behind him, returning with two cat ball packages. He handed one to me and one to Susie. With our compliments, sir and ma'am, he was smiling. I paid the invoice. Thank you, sir. Delivery to your ship will be within the hour. The main delay is customizing the cat wall. He peered into the cage again. Thank you, madam, for your custom, he said to Angel. Bring him back when you have fully trained him. Meow. He saw us to the door and waved to Susie as we left. I escorted them back to their ship, where we said our goodbyes. Back on the public walkway, Jane joined me. Three attempts on you. All four men are in custody, she said. She pulled out her left gun and offered it to me. I transferred the cage to my left hand, stuck the cat ball package under my left arm, and took the gun with my right hand. A holster appeared, and I slotted it in. Oddly, it didn't feel the way I thought it would. I actually enjoyed not having guns strapped on me for a while. This concludes another episode of the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. Thanks for joining me, your host, Benjamin Douglas, for another indie author reading. If you liked what you heard, be sure to visit http colon slash slash thebookspeakspodcast.wordpress.com for more episodes and for links to the author's website and the author's Amazon author page in the show notes. If you'd like to follow me on my own author journey, you can find me at http colon slash slash benjamindouglasbooks.wordpress.com. And of course, if you're an indie author interested in having your work featured on the show, or if you're interested in discussing having your book read and produced by me as an audiobook, feel free to contact me at benjamindouglasbooks at gmail.com. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you have a productive and enjoyable weekend.